All right? Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, if you have it in the Word of God this morning. One verse, verse 27, we are looking at the life of Moses and learning so much about faith. Amen. A lot of people don't look at the book of Hebrews as an end time book. They talk about Daniel, Revelation, other prophets, etc. as end time books. But the book of Hebrews is an end time book. Amen. A prophecy a uh, person, prophecy teacher. Many of you have heard of this man, Hal Lindsey. He wrote a book years ago. Most of the time he focuses on prophecy, but he wrote a book called Combat Faith. And I don't have that book anymore, but he focused on faith for the end times. So I was thinking about that this morning. This book of Hebrews is an end time book. You need it, I need it. Big time. I mean big time. So I thank God for what he's revealing to us in this, in this text of Scripture because there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of pressures. There are a lot of spiritual warfare that's trying to get you lukewarm, backslid, carnal in your mind, depressed, discouraged, whatever. And this encourages us to see people who've gone through some things that did not quit. We need a lot of fire under it. It's ridiculous. Verse 27, Hebrews eleven twenty-seven. 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is what? Invisible. For by faith he forsook Egypt, what? Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, faith that forsakes and Endures is the title of the message. Faith, Moses, faith that forsakes and endures. Let's worship God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We give you all praise and all glory and all honor, Lord. You are worthy to be worshiped, God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. All right, you may be seated. I'll teach you the Word of God. Good to see you this morning. So we see something here. By faith, he forsook Egypt. Now notice it says, by faith, he forsook Egypt. It doesn't say, by fear, he forsook Egypt. It says, by faith, he forsook Egypt. So there's two events in the life of Moses that people look at to see to determine what Hebrews 11 is talking about. Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 2. And the first one is the occurrence in chapter 2 where he sees an Egyptian smiting one of his brethren. Okay. So let's look at verse 11. Came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew one of his brethren. He looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest the Egyptian? And Moses, what? Feared. Oh, it's different, isn't it? By faith he forsook, but here he feared. It's not the same event. And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he, what? Sat down by a well. So when the Bible says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. It can't be in this one. It can't be in this part. It's got to be a later time. It's got to be at the time of the Exodus. Okay? So when we look at it, let's just see what's going on here as we lay lay the the foundation for the teaching this morning. When we see, first of all, he sees this Egyptian smiting one of his brethren. It doesn't mean that that Egyptian would just sort of like, you know, barely hitting him or whatever. 
it means that this Egyptian was inflicting mortal wounds on one of the Israelites. So it was a very serious thing. This Egyptian was about to kill an Israelite. And Moses, I believe, by the word of God, I believe that he was led by God to go and see what was going on with his brethren. He knew he was a Jew. Amen. And when he went and he saw what was going on among his brethren, he saw this Egyptian about ready to kill or killing, smiting his brother. And when he saw that, he looked this way and he looked that way, not in order to commit a crime. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we interpret it that way, it's not correct. He wasn't looking around to see if somebody's going to see him before he kills this guy so that he could commit the crime. When it says he looked this way and he looked that way, he was looking for somebody to intervene. Somebody that would bring salvation. Somebody that would help his brother. But when he looked this way and that way and he saw no intercessor, he looked this way and that and he saw nobody to help. He looked this way and that and he saw nobody bringing salvation. He stepped in and he says, I've got to take it on myself. And, and so in a sense, his motive was not to commit a crime here. His motive was to help. His motive was pure. His motive was good. His motive, are you understanding, was to deliver one of his brethren, because there's nobody else that would do it. So when he did that, then what he did is going to be in misinterpreted. And I'm not saying that him killing the Egyptian was a good thing. I don't believe he had a precept or a command from God to kill the man. What I'm trying to tell you is that when he looked this way and that, he was looking for somebody to come and help him. But there was nobody there, so he took it upon himself. And he killed, he murdered the Egyptian, which I don't believe was, was the right thing to do. But I'm talking about his intention. His heart was to intervene because one of his brethren is being hit, okay? So are y'all understanding that? Well, then later on the Bible says he sees a couple of, his, of the brethren, the Israelites, fussing and fighting with each other. And he intervenes, correct, on that. Right? And he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And then ultimately the Bible says he has to flee because Pharaoh wants to kill him now. Okay. So he flees here now in fear. The Bible is very clear. He flees in fear. So it's not the time where he forsook Egypt. It's when he's fearing that he's running now. Amen. Amen. So what is going on here is that Moses already has a revelation that he's supposed to be the Savior. He has a revelation that he's supposed to be the Deliverer. And so he intervenes to try to let the people realize, hey, God has called me to be that Redeemer. He's called me to be that Deliverer. And already the people are rejecting his leadership. Already they are misinterpreting his leadership. That tells me there's something wrong with them. Something's wrong with the people of Israel when the Redeemer comes and they don't have an understanding about who he is. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus Christ came into the world. He came into his own, the own his own received him not, but to as many as received him gave he the power to become the sons of God. And so what I see, I believe, is that... that Moses had a revelation that he was that redeemer. He was that deliverer. And when he tries to intervene, he kills the Egyptian to save his brethren. He intervenes in the behalf of his brethren and the brethren reject him. It is because they are so messed up. They've been slaves for so long. They've been in bondage for so long that I believe at this point they really don't have the kind of walk with God that they need. In fact, later on in the 13th chapter of the book of Exodus, in the 14th chapter, Moses has to tell them, don't be afraid. We're going to leave, but you need to stop being afraid. Why was Moses not afraid when they left Egypt, but the people was afraid? Because they did not believe God. And so what we have is a manifestation in the hearts of the people. Because they did not believe God. Now they are misinterpreting the leadership of Moses. 
So the Bible tells us that he has to flee for his life, and we know that that's according to Acts chapter 7 when he's 40 years of age. He flees to the backside of the desert, and there he is for 40 years on the backside of the desert. Amen. I believe it's Halley's Bible commentary I read many, many, many years ago. He said that Moses had these different stages in his life. The first 40 was in Egypt. The second 40 was on the backside of the desert. He called it a, back, a backside of the desert degree, a BD degree. He got his BD degree on the backside of the desert. He was there for 40 years. And then when he comes back out, out of the wilderness, out of the, out of the desert, the last 40 years, he leads Israel into the promised land, ultimately, or tries to lead them to the promised land. He doesn't enter in. So there were three stages in his life. We now come to the second stage. He's been in Egypt for 40 years. He could have been the apparent heir to the throne of Egypt, probably the next Pharaoh of Egypt as we study the Bible. But the Bible says he flees for his life out of fear, not out of faith, but out of fear. He's been misinterpreted by his brethren. And so he goes to the back side of the desert, and you can read the story in the third chapter. The Bible says God appears to him. When he's on the backside of the desert, at the end of that next 40-year period, which brings him to 80 years of age. Now, when we look at this, this is very interesting to me. Because even though, think about this, when he fled, his brethren rejected him. He's fleeing because he fears the wrath of the king at this ju juncture in his life. He goes over to Midian. He's there for 40 years. Now think about that. For 40 years, his faith endured. Now listen to what I'm telling you. Faith that endures and forsakes. His faith endured through the first 40 years when he could have had the throne. He could have had the treasures, the riches, the pleasures of Egypt. But his mother put inside of him during that three years where she was raising him before he was given over into uh, the, the palace of Egypt, his mother taught him the things of God. His mother taught him the wisdom and the ways of God. And so for 40 years, even though he was surrounded by an Egyptian culture and he could have been the next Pharaoh, that wisdom of God, that word of God that was put in him by his mother prevailed. Because at the end of the 40 years, he starts feeling that call to deliver his people, which brings about the previous events. The next 40 years, even though he was rejected by his brethren, misinterpreted by his brethren, his intentions were good, but they were so carnal they couldn't understand it. They were so out of touch spiritually they didn't understand it. And they misinterpreted him, so he had to run for his life. He had to go to another place. But for 40 years on the backside of the desert, his faith endured. Now think about that. Four decades, brothers and sisters. Four decades on the backside of the wilderness plus the first four decades when he was in Egypt. His faith endured. Got a question for you today. How many people in the church, their faith would endure for four decades? Even four decades. Uh, you know, a lot of people get in the church and they're on fire for the first few years. Boy, they, they got a passion for the Lord. They're worshiping and praising God. Amen. They're giving and their offerings. They're, they're supporting the work of God. They're trying to help further the kingdom of God. They're doing everything they can to serve God in those early years. But as time goes by, that changes. Because their faith doesn't endure. It doesn't endure. Think about some, you know, the, and I'm not talking about anybody here. Okay. Amen when I say this. Amen. But think about people who've been in the church, they're older now, yes, been in the church for a, for a long time. But when they were younger, they were supporting the work. When they were younger, they were serving. When they were younger, they were dedicated. When they were younger, they were praying. When they were dead, when they were younger, they were on fire for God. But with time, that younger person grows old. 
And so now that older person, instead of supporting the work of God and being dedicated to God, they actually become resistance, resistors to growth. So when the church starts trying to reach out and the church has a desire to grow, all they've got now is a critical spirit. They come to church and they don't like this and they don't like that, you know, and they're just up in arms about everything, but they not, you should not be that way. And I tell you what's happened to them. With time, their faith has dwindled. And I'm asking you this morning, as I stand before you as your preacher, as your pastor, I'm some of your pastor, and I'm just some of you, to some of you, I'm just a preacher. But I'm going to ask you this morning, right now, how long have you been in the church of the living God? And you remember when you first got in the church, how dedicated you were? You gave to everything. You, you supported the work of God. You prayed. You fasted. You served God with all your heart. But I'm asking you, what about now? Now have you dwindled in your faith? Now instead of being somebody that's on fire for God, dedicated, now you become more of a problem. In the church. Now you become somebody that's resisting the work of God. Let us be like Moses. That even if Pharaoh is coming after you. Even if the brethren reject you. Let us have the faith of Moses. That will endure a minimum of four decades. Give God praise in this house. I pray to God, brothers and sisters, this really rings my bell because I've been in the kingdom of God for 40 years, a little over 40 years, about 42 years now. And this really rings my bell. Do I still have the same fire, the passion to serve God now at 40 that I had when I first got in the church? I pray that I'm more dedicated, more committed, have a great desire, a great des- greater desire to see the kingdom of God further than where I was when I first got in the church. This helps me this morning to see a man that endured such hard things. And he didn't let it stop his faith. His faith endured. I'm asking you this morning, where are you? Where am I this morning? I thank God for youthful exuberance. I thank God for, oh, well, praise God. We need to talk to our young people about that. But I can tell you at least this, when they have their youth services, I don't know what it's about when they have their own thing. But when they have their youth services, they'll be up here praising and worshiping God, speaking in tongues and crying. So I don't know what it is when they get in here, you know, with us as a group. Maybe they just kind of, you know, shut down. I don't know what it is. But I thank God for our young people. And I thank God for you. But I'm going to tell you right now, brothers and sisters, you and I have to have a faith that will endure decades. That will endure long term. I don't want to get cooler. I, don't, I want to get hotter. I don't want to become less dedicated. I want to become more dedicated. I want to increase my prayer life. I want to increase my giving. I want to increase my service. I want the church to go. The kingdom of God. I don't want to become a pew setter. And I, I don't know how you think my mentality is this. When I preach... I, I ask myself oftentimes, you're going you're to preach to the same people. Are you doing anything different in your preparation? Are you doing anything different in what you're going to do when you stand before those people and preach than you would do if you were asked to preach in a conference? I'm just saying to you, brothers and sisters, that whatever you do in the kingdom of God... Hallelujah. Despise not the day of small things. Because whatever you do in the kingdom of God, if it's the day of small things, do it like you're going to preach to hundreds or thousands of people. If you're going to preach to two, preach like you're going to, if you're preaching to a thousand or two thousand people. When you prepare to preach, prepare like you're being asked to preach at a conference. When you prepare to sing in the choir, you prepare like you're singing at the Dove Awards. I'm just asking you, if somebody asked you to sing in the Dove Awards, would you sing the same way there as you do here? If that makes a difference, the difference is not the atmosphere. The difference is in you. 
You should have a passion for God if you're singing here or, or, or you're preaching here. You should have a passion for God that you want to make it the best, whether it's a conference or just here or whatever. I'm just asking you right now. It's ridiculous because what we do, we should do unto God Almighty. And I was thinking about it, and I've seen, I've been in conferences where Tribe Tibet sang. And we sang one of, his, one of his songs this morning. He can take a slow song, a song that doesn't have a fast beat, but you can still hear his passion. You know, that slow song he sang, that's one of his slow songs. But when he sings, he goes, woo! I'm asking you. It shouldn't be how fast, how slow the song is. It's you've got a burning fire on the inside of you for Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you a question this morning. If Tri Tibet came to you and said, would you sing in my choir? Would you have what it took? And I'm not talking about a pretty voice. I'm talking about anointing, a passion, a desire, a fire inside of you. I've been in those conferences. I know what I'm talking about. And they bring something. And he's a Jesus name apostolic, by the way. Okay, and I don't necessarily agree with the way they go in the area. You know, they, they, many of them forsake holiness and all of that. We're not going to do that. But at least they've got a fire burning in them. They've got a passion for God. I've been there. Come on, somebody. And I'm asking you this morning, do you have that kind of fire inside of you? Or is it one that, can, that was, you know, can dwindle over time? Or your faith that doesn't endure decades of time, but, you know, for a while you, you've got it. For a while you're on fire. For a while. Yeah, hallelujah to the Lamb. But something has happened. And what has happened is, over time, your faith hasn't endured. You've lost a persistence and an insistence on the things of God. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And I don't want you to just say amen to me right now. But how do you come in here when you come to church? I, I've seen people claim to be called to preach. Come in here all mad about something. I mean just messed up. What's going on there? And I'm not talking about one time. I'm talking about over and over and over. Don't have enough of God in them to overcome an ant. We have got to get this together. And I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm going to preach to myself. But a lot of you, when I preach, you're not going to listen. You're not going to do what, I've, what I preach to you anyway. But the problem is this man is an example to us of endurance. And I thank God for this example. Hallelujah. I want my latter days to be stronger than my early days. And I've told you this before, and I'm not mad at you. I'm just, I've got a zeal burning inside of me this morning. And I've studied this, and it's a real number. It's not something I've fabricated in my mind. But somebody took time to look at people in the Bible. What we would call heroes of faith or whatever. Matriarchs and patriarchs, women and men of God. And they determined as they looked at each one of these people, they said, that about 75% of the people that you find in the Bible, that you read about in the Bible, about 75% of them do not finish well. That's not a made-up number. That means only about 25% finished well. I'm getting a little bit older, brothers and sisters, and that rings a bell in my life. Because I've been in this a while, and I don't want to finish. Come on, somebody. I don't want to finish not well. I want to finish well. Praise God. Some of y'all are young in body. You're younger than I am in body. You Come on, you got the strength in your body and your mind to do something in the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord Jesus. So as you look at your life right now, just like I look at mine, I look at my life and I say, okay, I'm, I'm this amount in the kingdom of God, about four decades. Do I still have the fire? Do I still have the passion? Do I still love the word of God? Do I still pre prepare with excellence? 
Or have I become just somebody that's a coaster that's not going to finish well? This man of God shows me a man whose faith endures through decades. And the latter part of his life, the last 40, come on, he's, eight, he's over 80 when he first leads the people out. And all the way up to 120, right? He had so many battles in the wilderness with those people. So many battles. Amen. But he had a walk with God. So where, where's the life? Where is the life? And they say, well, Pastor, this happened to be Really? Look at this man. Look what happened to him. He's got somebody wants to kill him. His brethren have rejected him. But it didn't stop his faith. His faith endured through decades and decades and decades. It did not dwindle. That's what we have to have. And that's why God chose Moses as an example to those Hebrews. Because those Hebrews, many of them are backsliding. They're quitting. And God said, I've got a man I want to show you who will not quit. I've got a man I want to show you who endures. I've got a man. I, come on. So you need to get rid of, we need to get rid of our little excuses of why we feel like quitting or going to quit. No, we don't, you don't have an excuse before God Almighty. There is no excuse. Praise God, brothers and sisters. Really what it is, is our flesh. Our flesh wants what it wants. Yeah, praise God. And we can, we can try to justify it and we can analyze it and we can interpret the scripture to sort of fit in what we want, you know, and say, yeah, 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 whatever. We either got a passion for God, we've got a faith today that is enduring, that will last for decades. Brother, don't you ever get cold. Don't you ever get cool. You keep worshiping, you keep running, you keep praising, you keep serving, you keep mowing the lawns, you keep, you keep giving like you're giving. You'll never regret it. But when you've been in this 40 years, if Jesus hasn't come back, I pray you're more on fire than you are now. Give the Lord praise in the house. And maybe, maybe some of it, and I'll be honest with you, maybe some of it, the condition of many of you, is my fault. Maybe that's the case. I'll own it if that's, if that's possible, if that's probable. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, I don't want to be that person whose faith has dwindled. After decades, I want it to be more alive, more. Give God praise in the house. Recently, and I've got to move quickly this morning, and I'll turn this into a very long message. We went to Taiwan, and we uh, preached in Brother and Sister Edmund's anniversary. They've been there for 40 years. We preached, Sister Christine and I went there. We preached their 40th anniversary. Amen. I said 40th anniversary there. Those people are strong. They pray for hours before anything is ever preached. They are strong. I'm not saying they don't have any problems. They're just like you. I can go down the line and say, okay, this one's just like Nathaniel. This one's just like, and just go down the line because they're, they're really a mirror of you and you're a mirror of them. But after 40 years, I can tell you they're strong. Dedicated, committed to God. Worked so hard. Brother Edmund's got two men. They worked so hard, skin and bones. Their health has been affected because of the way they've given their self to the work of God. Come on, say praise the Lord. And I thank God for the men that helped me and the, the sisters that helped me because some of you work that way. You labor. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, I talked to him the other day on the phone. I said, Brother Edmonds, I said, I thank God for the example. I said, y'all been there for 40 years. And I said, look what you've done. You know, he's getting older now. And I said, rejoice. Look at what you've done. Look, look, look at the strength of, that, of those people that are there. Hallelujah. And I just rejoiced in what was accomplished there. But I'm just telling you, their faith is still on fire. They're still serving. They're dedicated. Hallelujah. So Moses, this particular verse is talking about his endurance. And if you have endurance, that means you have an insistence. If you have endurance, that means you have a persistence about you. That no matter what comes against you, you insist on God's will. No matter what comes against you, you persist on God's will.
But by faith he forsook Egypt. That means he forsook the treasures of Egypt. The privileges of Egypt. The life of Egypt. And that brings me to the end of the second 40 years of his life. When he goes back to deliver the people of God. Amen. The scripture tells us, give God praise. In the 14th chapter, in verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. See, it's different now. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. So after 40 years on the backside of the desert, God has called him in Exodus chapter 3 to go and deliver the people. He shows back up. He could have had an excuse. He could have said, well, you know, they rejected me the first time, so see you, bye, good riddance. But his faith would let it go. And so when he's 80 years of age, he shows back up, and his faith endures. It had endured to 40. Now it's going to endure as he stands before Pharaoh. This time he's not leaving by fear. He's leaving by faith. And so he looks at the people and he tells the people, fear not. Again, where are the people? Where are the people? They're in unbelief. Even at this point, they're fixing to leave, man. They're fixing to go on this journey. They're fixing to leave Egypt. But they don't have enough faith to believe. And so he has to look at these people once again and say, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Are y'all understanding? So here's where he forsakes by faith, by the word of God. Not fearing the wrath of the king. It was an enduring, persistent, insistent service that we find in this old man of God. The Bible says in the fifth chapter, going back right before he, he... Leaves is going to leave Egypt. I'm just trying to show you when that text is talking about. It's a faith thing. It's a forsaking, not a fear thing. In 5 and 18, as you, as you go through this text, you'll see that Moses has gone before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh hardens his heart. Amen. Do you think Moses gave up? No, he endured. Pharaoh said, no. Moses said, let my people go. He walked in there. He wasn't shy. He wasn't timid. He walked in the presence of the king of Egypt. And he said, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. It was a persistent insistence that was created by faith. And Pharaoh, yeah, who is the Lord God that I should obey him? Because he thinks he's God, you know. Did that stop Moses' persistence? Did it stop his insistence? Did it stop his endurance? No, he goes before Pharaoh. Let my people go. Pharaoh doesn't let him go. He probably said, well, I tried. I tried. Didn't work out. No, he didn't quit. He endured. And so we go on in chapter 5. Because of this, uh, because of this amen. His insistence and persistence. What does Pharaoh do? He makes things harder on the people. So he says, verse 18, go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall you deliver the, the what? The tail of bricks. You're going to have to bring the same production, but I'm not providing you straw. So what he's doing is, he's bringing, it's making it hard on the people. So if you'll understand it, Moses' leadership, Moses' leadership, is making it hard on the people. 
So verse 18, what does, the, what does Israel do? What do the leaders do that's with Israel? Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet shall you, de- you deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. After it was said, you shall not minish aught from your bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto them, the Lord, look upon you and judge. Because you have made our, our savor to be aboard in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil and treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he had done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. So instead of it getting better for them, it's actually getting worse. So Moses, look, he's human. He goes, but what does he do with it? What does he do with this humanness? He goes to God. And he said, God, it's getting worse, not better. And I've gone in there and say, let thy people go, and you haven't delivered them. What's going on here, God? He doesn't understand that Pharaoh's heart in his heart is so that God can use signs and wonders. He doesn't understand that at this point. But the problem is he has to endure when Pharaoh refuses to let them go. Number two, he has to endure when the people of God are standing up in opposition against him. Let me put it to you this way. They don't trust his leadership. And the problem is not with Moses. The problem is with them. Moses could have said, wow, you know, I can handle Pharaoh treating me like that. But I'm trying to help these people. And they misinterpret that. And now the people of God are fighting me. He could have said, forget it. Now, if God told him to go somewhere else, that would have been different. But God didn't tell him that. So I'm asking you right now, brothers and sisters, do you have faith that endures decades, number one? Number two, do you have the kind of faith that is insistent and persistent even if Pharaoh says no and even if the people of God reject you? Thank God, brother. You're going to be tested in that area. No more. More. So you let me tell you something right now. This man refused to quit. Now, it's one thing to have the world come against you, but when the church comes against you, the one you're trying to help come against you, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's the one that makes you want to go, bye. Don't you realize Moses is trying to help you? Don't you realize that? But now you look at him as somebody that's making it worse for you? Really, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. And this is a true statement. It is not just necessarily theological, but it's a true statement in relationship to life. When people that should be there for you are not there for you, are you understanding? When that happens, it puts you in a suicide mode. Because there's there's nothing that will bring you down more than the people that should be there with you and for you, come on, aren't. You've got to have some kind of faith that will overcome. Come on, listen to me. Some of your family members forsake God. They quit the church. Where's your faith? You say, well, you know, my family's not living for the Lord, so I'm going to get carnal. No. You have to have an insistence and a persistence no matter what happens. Even if those that you, you know, look to say, hey, you should be with me. And they're not? Do you have the kind of faith that endures? Do you have the kind of faith that persists? Do you have a kind of faith that insists he would not quit? Now, I've been in situations where in pastoring, people, similar situations to this, okay? God took care of it. We keep going. 
Are you understanding? I've also been in situations where family member will quit the church and it leaves a spouse in the church. And for a while, well, Pastor, I ain't going, I'm not going anywhere. Pastor, I'm not following them. Pastor, I'm here. Knowing that the decision that they made was wrong to leave. Knowing it. Knowing that they were wrong. Pastor, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. Okay? I know that they, they've done wrong. And for a while, they persist. And for a while, they insist. But after, I've seen this many times. After a while, those people would say, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm not going with them. They're wrong. After a while. Bye bye, birdie. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's come So let's see the action. Let's not just hear words. Let's see the action. Because I've been in this for a while. Come on, somebody. And so when you look around and you don't see people that should be there with you in this fight, come on. If you're a church leader and you've got people in the church that should be with you to further the kingdom of God and be with you in this fight, all they do is talk a good talk, but they won't give anything. They talk a good fight, but they don't do anything. You as a leader have to say, you know what? I'm going to persist. I'm going to insist on the will of God. I'm not quitting. I'm going to keep on serving God. I'm not going to let my fire dwindle because you're putting a a wet blanket on it. Uh, One preacher said years ago, and I believe with all my heart, he said, don't worry about, you know, the the fire getting out of hand in the church because there's always wet blankets in the church to put it out. You know, so if you're worried about me getting too on fire, don't worry about it because there's plenty of wet blankets in this church to put my fire out. They're going to try. And I'm not making this about me. I'm just telling you I have to be an example before you. You have got to get something inside of you that will endure. When it comes time for you to make a decision in your life, when the world offers you what your flesh wants, You have to say no. Come on. You have to refuse and choose and esteem. And because he did, his faith endured. Now, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm trying to wake you up. Because this church needs, let me tell you, I love all of you. You know I love you. But this church needs a wake-up call. I said it needs a wake-up call. You need a wake-up call right now. I need a wake-up call. Well, let's see what happens. The plagues begin to break out on Egypt. Now God gets to demonstrate his power against the gods. We could title this the battle of the God slash S. The battle of the gods. Faith that endures and persists and insists. Because there was a battle of the gods. There's only one true God, but the gods of Egypt said they were gods. And so the one true God of the heavens and the earth began to send plagues against the so-called gods of Egypt. Every plague that happened there was against a certain particular God that they worshipped. And God is saying, okay, you serve the frog God, the reptile God. He's not a God at all. I'll take care of them. You worship the Nile, I'll turn the Nile into blood. Every one of them, every one of those plagues was God, the battle of the gods. We'll just call it that, the battle of the gods. Moses, faith that forsook and endures. There is a, and I'm going to preach it tonight. I already had a message called the battle of the gods for tonight. It's going to be a barn burner tonight. But there's a battle for the gods right now. A battle of the gods right now. One true God is battling false gods. And that's where it is right now. God set me on fire in this hour, God. So the battle of the gods, it's on, man. God, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord God that I I should obey him? God said, I'll show you who I am. And all these so-called gods you serve, he said, 
I'm going to defeat every one of them. He doesn't have a lot really going for him other than the power of God and the signs of God. So as a result, chapter 8, he doesn't fear the wrath of the king. So verse 15, and Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Amen. All right. You want to go worship your God. You want to sacrifice to your God. But let's compromise. Let's cut a deal, Moses. Let's compromise. Okay. Let me say this to you, brothers and sisters. When people stand in the way of your separation, and there will be people who will stand in the way of your separation, Moses is standing in the way of the separation of the people of God. When, the, when a person stands against you in your separation to God, don't fear that person. They will want you to compromise. They will want you to stay in their land. You can worship, but just stay here in the land. Come on. Oh, don't separate yourself. Don't be so insistent and persistent. Let's compromise. I'll let you worship your God, but it's got to be in Egypt. And Moses said in his spirit, he knew he couldn't worship the light in the place of darkness. Come on, give God praise. There's idols everywhere. What, what I mean by that is Moses is not going to add his God to the rest of them. That's what I mean by that. He said, I'm not going to mix the worship of Egypt with the worship of God. But the enemy will always try to come and wear down your insistence. Wear down your persistence. Wear down your endurance. Hinder your separation. Worship in the land. Moses said, it is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abominations of the Egyptians before their eyes. And we will, they will stone us. So we can't compromise. We got to leave the land. Faith that endures. So first of all, having preached what I've already preached, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you left Egypt? Yes, sir. Have you left Egypt? Yes, sir. And when I say leaving Egypt, I'm talking about the ways of Egypt. The unholy lifestyle of the Egyptians. Or are we trying... To hold on to the unholy lifestyle of the Egyptians and worship God at the same time. Moses said, no. His faith endures. It's persistent. It's insistent. That Pharaoh could have had his head taken off his body. But he wasn't afraid. I know I'm not compromising with separation, he says. I'm not going to mix it. He knows he's got to leave the ways of the Egyptian. He knows he's got to leave the idolatry of the Egyptian to be a true worshiper. You have to leave the unholy lifestyles of the world. And you have to leave apostate churches. If you're in an apostate church that doesn't preach the truth, you can't stay there and mix with it. You've got to, I'm, I'm talking about apostate churches. If you go to a church where they don't preach the truth, they're apostate. You've got to leave that apostate system and find a church that's preaching the truth where God is. But there's always going to be somebody who wants you to compromise that. So he said, I'm leaving the ways of Egypt, the unholy lifestyle. I'm leaving the doctrine of Egypt, the idolatry, the apostasy of Egypt. And number three, I'm leaving the cruel service of Egypt. They were in hard bondage 
laboring hard. See, that's what the devil does to you. He makes your life hard. He makes your life miserable. He turns you into a slave. So you got to leave the ways of Egypt, the unholiness of the world. you got to leave the doctrine of Egypt, apostate Christendom. You have to leave that cruel bondage of service to sin and the devil. Separate yourself. Because if you think sin is going to make you happy, God shows you and puts you in slavery and in bondage. you got to say, I'm tired of being a slave. But Pharaoh wants you to no, He wants you to stay in the land. Compromise with your holiness. Compromise with doctrine. Compromise with the slavery you're in, the addictions you're in. I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's absolutely nothing that you and I can find ourselves in today that God cannot deliver you from. God can set you free from anything and everything. And such were some of you. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord our God. That means you used to live this way, but you have been delivered. So help me preach. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm leaving the ways of unholiness. I'm leaving apostasy. I'm leaving hard bondage. Hard living. Be due to sin. Come on. Now, listen to me carefully because I hear the Holy Ghost. See, if I'm not careful, I'll preach, I'll preach ahead of the anointing. Amen. When you get ready to do that, there's always going to be somebody there trying to stop you. There's always going to be somebody try to hinder that and try to make you compromise. You have to have a persistence and an insistence and not fear the wrath of that person. They'll threaten you. They'll threaten the church. I don't care. Because you have a persistence and an insistence. Moses said, no, Pharaoh. Can you imagine talking that way to a person who thinks he's God? Now, I want you to do this, Moses. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Because that would compromise. Well, let me see what I'll do. Do you have that kind of faith? You have that kind of insistence and that persistence when somebody's trying to hinder your separation? You can. I said, you can. If you don't have it, it's, your, it's because of you. It is not because of them. It is because of you. See, Moses could have said, well, Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, he got in my way. You think God would have accepted that? Well, my husband, he's hindering me from doing this. Providence Melvis, I'm going to just give it out there. I'm going to call you by name. She sat in my office the other day, and we were talking about Zambia. And, uh, you know, she, she, we, the church helped her with that building, etc. And then uh, at some point we said, okay, now you have to trust God by faith to, to finish it. Okay. Well, they came up, she came up with the money. They came up with the money to put the roof on it. And when she did that, do you think her family members walked up to her and patted her on the back and say, way to go. No, they got mad at her for finishing the church because they wanted the money for themselves. insistence and persistence didn't make a difference if they got mad at her or not she put the roof on the building and I'm going to tell you brothers and sisters when you get ready to make a commitment to God there's going to be somebody that said no I don't think you should do that there has to be an insistence and a persistence inside of you because they're going to get mad you know why they're going to get mad because they want the money for themselves Show me. Don't talk. Show me. And so she came in my office and sat down. And we were talking and she said, you know, certain things have happened in Zambia. They went in because there were no doors or windows on the building. They went in and they stole the lights out of the church building. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, you helped them. So I said, what now? We're we going to put doors on it. We're going to put uh, windows in it, praise God, and put lights back in there. How much it is it? And we, she said she already had it all figured out on her phone. And uh, 
came up with the amount, right? And I told Sister Christina, I said, Sister Christina, write the check for her, give it to her Sunday. Are you understanding? Now, I believe one reason why the Lord put that in my spirit is because of her faith, come on, to put the roof on the building. That showed me some initiative on her part. Hallelujah to the lab. It showed, it, come on, it showed God where her heart was. But I'm just saying anything you try to do in the kingdom of God, there's going to be somebody that's going to try to come in and hinder that separation. You can't let them stop you. If it's their money, let them die with their money. But if it's your money, you can do whatever you want to do with it. You've got to have something inside of you, an insistence and a persistence to do the will of God. You do what you can, and I promise you, God will step in and do what you can't do. Say hallelujah to the Lamb. Woo, I feel good all over. Some of y'all have stepped up the last few months in your support. God bless you. You did that by faith. Some of you don't have it, but you did it anyway. And when it came time for you to be helped, God released me to help. You got a brand new air conditioner heater sitting on the top of this roof. When you get in your cars and you drive out of the back lot or you drive around from the front, look up there and see that pretty beautiful. It's a beautiful, brand new, five-ton heater air conditioner sitting on this roof. Say, praise the Lord. Oh, I want you to know the enemy will stand up and challenge all of that. But guess what? When you can't fight God because God will step and say, I'll take care of that. Say, praise the Lord. So I thank God for it. It was right. It was the right timing. And I'm not going to get into all of that. That's for a different time. But I'm just telling you. I thank God for people who put their money where their mouth is. Sister Christina said this to me. And I know I'm preaching. Sister Christina said, well, well, she said, I think we just have some poor people in the church. I said, we don't have poor people in the church. We've got people that are in debt. They worship the God of debt. They have bowed their knees to the God of debt. They're not poor. They're in debt. Now, you, you know, if you need to do that, fine, okay? You need to, you know, take out a loan or whatever. But you better not get so in debt that you can't give to the work of God. If you can't give to the work of God because you're so in debt, you know who your God is? Your belly. You're not poor. There's nobody in this church that's poor. I'm not poor. You're not poor. Nobody's poor. Are you understanding by the world's understanding of poverty? We just have a lot of good excuses. But there has to be a persistence when it comes to your sacrifice. There has to be a persistence. I anticipate where I won't have to say much more about that in the future. But we're in a season right now when God says, holes in the bag. That's the season we're in right now. At some point, I believe we're going to have abundance. And I won't have to address it. But right now... God has called you. God has called you. Yeah, and I want to tell you something. There ain't nobody in here that's got a harder head than, than I do. So you want to butt heads with me? You come butt heads with me. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to walk away. Your head's going to be hurt. Mine won't. Because I know when I've heard from God. Say praise the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. But there will always be something that will come in and say, No, that's, you know, that's too much. Nah, it's too much. Yeah, whatever. You getting the point? I love the Lord. I know God. See, God is faithful to you. God is faithful to me. God is faithful to this church. He always has been. And he always will be. Okay, so let me just, let me just tell you that I'm going to offend some of you. But it's going to be a good offense. He spoke to me and he said, those that aren't doing it, he said, you don't need them anyway. 
you don't need them anyway. And when I say that, I'm not saying I want you to leave. What I'm saying is, God said, you don't need them anyway. I'll use the ones that will. So if you think I'm preaching like this because I lack faith, or because I really need, no, God said, you don't need them anyway. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Say, praise the Lord. So I bless you anyway in the name of Jesus. Do you understand what's happening here? So you have to have a persistence and an insistence, right? An endurance. Because the enemy will always try to get you to compromise in the area of your sacrifice. He says, Moses says, no. We will go three days journey. We're not going to sacrifice in the land, in the wilderness, and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. Entreat. <laughs> I love it. Compromiser. Stay in the land. No, I can't do that. No, that'll compromise my worship. Okay. All right. Well, let's cut another deal. I'll let you go a little ways out, but not too far. Don't take it too far. Don't take your walk with God too far. Don't let it cost you anything. You better believe I'm on fire today. Don't let it cost you too much because remember, you got all this debt. Poor money managers. That's the problem. That, you don't have a financial problem. You've got a wisdom problem. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Who's my God and who is your God? And if you're giving God, bless you. But you know what God tells you and what he requires of you. I didn't put a dollar sign on any of your head. I didn't ask any of you to give a certain amount. You know what God's telling you to do. And I know what God's telling me to do. Brothers and sisters, God is so good. We've been in situations in this church where, where we, we wanted to give to God. You know what? We want, my wife and I wanted to give to God. Because we were trying to do something here, you know, years ago. And I had a truck and I put thousands of dollars into that truck. And we didn't have a way to give an offering. So you know what I did? I had a truck it was paid for. I went and sold it and got and brought every dime of it to the Lord. There is a way if you really want it. There is a way if you really want it. I live what I preach. I don't just believe what I preach. I live what I preach. And so does my wife. And I'm not mad at you, but I feel, I will tell you something, there's a fire that burns against me, against that spirit. Amen. Just, don't, just don't go too far. Insistence says, you heard me. You heard God. God said, three days journey. That means we're going three days journey. Pharaoh could have looked at that shepherd and said, who do you think you are? Don't you know I can kill you on the spot? But his faith says, I don't fear you. I don't fear you. Now maybe you want me to stand up here as I preach like, you know, this, these things. You want me to be, I don't know, with a smile on my face, you know, and all calm and cool collected. But I want you to know something. When somebody gets ready to do surgery on me, I don't want to look at them and have a big old grin on their face. I want them to have serious, a serious look on their face if they're going to be cutting on me. So I'm cutting on some of you, and I got a serious face right now. Somebody said, praise the Lord. And I'm not saying any of us are really that sacrificial, any of us including the pastor preaching this morning. But that's, come on. But there's always going to be something that tries to step in into our life. All of us. And say, just don't go too far. 
I was joking with Ryan the other day, and you know, I can't do this with everybody because they get all behind hurt, you know. <laughs> but I walked up to him, and he was sitting there writing his tithes and offerings out, and I said, that's not enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, that's not enough. <laughs> he did act like he was changing his envelope, and I said, that's still not enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But he's the only one I can talk like. Maybe not the only one, but... You know, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know. I just want to know did it do any good. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you know what I'm talking about. Come on. I'm not preaching down to you. You know what I'm talking about. There's always been a challenge. Always. Sister Brittany, years ago, about a couple of years ago, gave a large offering to the church. God bless her heart. A, a, a single mom. A single mom. God gave her the ability to do it. And I talked to her. I actually tried to talk her out of it. I couldn't talk her out of it. She gave it, you know. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I told her years ago, I said, you know what? God's going to watch over you and God's going to take care of you. God's going to provide for you. I told her that. Not because I was trying to get anything out of her. She already gave it. And she, called, she told me, she texted me the other day. She said, Pastor, she said, the Choctaw Nation is going to pay my rent for three months along with my electricity. Yeah. She, she didn't ask for it. She didn't write a letter and say, would you help me? They took it upon themselves, the Choctaw Nation, to contact her and say, we want to do something for you. <laughs> now, you can say that's just man, but I see the hand of God in that. And I'm not preaching this to get anything out of you. God's already told me I don't need those that don't want to do it anyway. He told me that. So I believe God would tell you that. Yeah, oh yeah, you don't know. Because already, God's already spoken. I said God has already spoken. And when you hear God and you believe God, there is a way. Don't tell me there's no way. It's called faith. F-A-I-T-H. Is spelled R I S K. And that didn't originate with me. I think that originated with T.F. Tenney. He said, You know how you spell faith? R I S K. Risk. Come on, give God praise in the house. I'm excited about the Lord. Amen. It's the truth. So anyway, you get it, right? So offer in the land, no. Persistent insistence. Just don't go too far away. No, we're going three days journey. Persistence and insistence. Chapter 10, I got to go very quickly here. Chapter 10. Right? Verse 11, he says, not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Now, now Pharaoh says, okay, <coughs> experiencing all these plagues. So he's still compromising. Still trying to get Moses to compromise. You can go, but let only the men go. You leave your women, your children, your older women, you leave them all behind in Egypt, and you go out there and worship and serve your God. Moses said, insistent, persistent, no. We're taking our young, our old, we're taking our children, we're taking the old people with us. All the old people said, praise the Lord. We're taking the old people with us. And I'm not in that category. Hallelujah. We, we all going. We're not leaving anybody behind. Don't you feel at this point that Pharaoh is about ready to kill this man? But he did not fear the king. Yeah, some of you got zeal, but you still need to put it in action. He didn't just get up there and talk a good talk. When it came down to it, he did it. Is this helping? Is anybody being talked to right now? 
Is there any situation in your life right now where you got somebody like Pharaoh that wants to compromise, get you to compromise? Stay here. No. Not too far. No. Three days journey. Come on. Only your men. No. We're all. We're taking them all. Our children, everything. See, you can't leave your, you can't sacrifice your children to the false God of false education. That's what the enemy wants. See, watch this. He's going to come and try to put pressure on you as a parent. Not to instill the truths of God. Not to instill holiness into your children. That's what the education system will try to do. But you as a parent says, oh no, I'm still going to put it in them. I'm still going to tell them right from wrong. I'm, come on. And I mean, we've been, you know, we've got kids in here, children in here. And they go to school and they say, no, we don't, we don't celebrate this particular holiday or that particular holiday. You know, and why is that? Because the parents put it in those children. It would be so easy for them just to compromise. You can't leave your children behind. Praise the Lord. Get them. When you're in prayer, in the prayer room, get your children. Take them in the prayer room with you. Don't let them run around the church or outside. I got some gray hair so I can preach like this. You're in the prayer room and they're running the streets and you don't have a clue where they are. That's the enemy coming in and tell you leave your children behind. No, little Johnny, little Susie, I know you don't like it, but you're going to the prayer room with me tonight. And for those of you who don't know where the prayer rooms are, if you come through the front door, <laughs> you come through the front door, it's immediate right. Then it's an immediate left. Or you can just go straight down the hallway if you're a woman, because you have access from both halls. We really try to help the women here. So you can get in, you, you go through that front door, make a hard right, you go all the way down to the end. There's an entryway for the women's prayer room there. And if you don't like that way, then you can come through the back and you can go straight down all the way down. And there's another entryway for the women. See, we make it really easy for you. And it's all the way down there to the end, okay? And, you, you know, you men, if you come through the front door, you're going to have to go hard right. You're going to have to go hard left and hard right again. And right there, we only have one entry point for you because we're trying to lock you in once you get in there. Hallelujah. Because y'all are nervous, the nervous type, and you don't know what to do with yourself. So once you get in there, we got to shut the door. Okay, so anyway, that's where the prayer rooms are, just in case you don't, don't know it. And if you've got children, take them in there with you. They need to hear you pray. They need to learn how to pray. They're not going to know how to pray unless you show them. When is the last time you said to the enemy, I will be in the prayer room. I'm going to worship my God. And he comes and said, no, no, no. You got to be insistent and persistent to be there. Take your children with you. Don't leave them behind. Are you with me? Moses said, verse 9, we will go with our young, with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks. And our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. Amen. Are y'all with me? Then verse 24, Pharaoh says, well, okay, I'll let you go with your family, your children, your old people, whatever. I'll let them all go with you. But he said, just leave the cattle in the land. You see, now watch, the, everybody with me here? I don't, know if you're, I don't know if you're enjoying this or not, but I am. Did you see how persistent the enemy was? Right. Do you think the enemy's going to throw up his hands? No, he's persistent too. He's insistent too. You've got to have something in you that's more persistent and more insistent on what God is requiring you. And so Moses says, no, our cattle's going to go with us too. Praise the Lord. There shall not a hoof be left behind, for therefore must we take... To serve the Lord our God, we know not what 
we, with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. He said, we're taking it all with us because we don't know what God's going to require of us. We're not going to set aside the little because God might want it all. <laughs> Y'all all right? Oh, you, you should be unhappy with me this morning. You should be, you should be smiling and praising the Lord. And I mean, don't, don't, don't charge the platform on me. Because that might, I mean, I might get scared you start charging the platform. Praise the Lord. You get the point right? Okay, so he's not afraid of the wrath of the king. He's insistent and persistent and endures. And I promise you, brothers and sisters, in your life, there will be something that will come to try to hinder your separation. And you have to be insistent and persistent on the will and the word of God. And when you take a stand, then you got to put it in action. And he did. So the Bible tells us, in the, then he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. What? Enduring as seeing him who is invisible. So the 14th chapter, I believe, is where he does. I'm going to come to a close here. Praise God, I've done enough damage this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm wounded. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more. I want to read a real quick verse to you, and this is in the Psalms. Don't fear the wrath of men. Don't fear people who try to hinder your walk with God. God will take care of it. Here in Psalm 76 and verse 10, it says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. God said, I can, listen, you know, people could throw up their, you know, monkey dust all day long. You ever seen a gorilla throwing up monkey dust? Throwing up dirt everywhere, you know. Pa, 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 pa. You got people going to throw up monkey dust all day long. Right? Guess what? God's going to use their wrath to praise him. That's mind-boggling to me that God could do that. But the wrath of this king, God said, I'm going to use that to praise me. And because of his resistance and Moses' persistence, God could show his power. And then he's able to restrain. He's able to hinder. Okay, he'll say, you can go this far, but that's it. You are a destroyer. You are a destroyer. He's talking to the enemy. You're a destroyer. You can go this far, and that's it. Be, be encouraged today because the enemy, when he comes after you, he tries to hinder your separation, your walk with God. If you're insistent and persistent, God will say this far and no more. God will use the wrath of men to praise him and then he will restrain that which remains. How many of y'all believe that today? Anybody that touches the church of the living God. You are not to be at peace with them or that. You are called to be at peace with your enemies. But not with anybody that touches the church of the living God. Jesus went into the temple. And because they had touched his temple. He drove them out. He drove those money changers out and the animals out with a whip. Why? He didn't walk over there and say, hey, folks, I sure want to be at peace with you. So would you please, pretty please, would y'all please get up and go outside the temple? He didn't do that. He didn't say, I'm trying to have peace with you. He went and drove them out.
let me say it to you this way. Honey child, juicy fruit, sugar plum, menudo. Anybody that claims to be a Christian, that claims to be of God, when they start trying to touch the church, their God is not God. Their God is the devil. Pretty quick, pretty quick. Do you see how quick I am? Do you see? Even at 60, man. Of course, it was, it was falling rather, rather slowly. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Say praise the Lord. You don't, we don't fear the wrath of man. Let them, they, they have threatened us. We don't fear it. Guess what? I'm still here. And you're still here. Say praise the Lord. And they still throwing monkey dust. Still throwing monkey dust. And I don't want to know what the monkey dust is. I don't care anything. I don't want to hear anything that they got to say. But I do not fear it. And I'm not inviting it. I'm not trying to create more heat for the church. I'm walking in wisdom. All right? You with me here? But guess what? I'm here. You're here. And anybody that tries to destroy the church of the living God is not serving your God. I don't care if they call themselves a Christian or not. You ought to have enough understanding, enough fire inside of you to recognize, I don't care who they are, you're not of God. Amen. You with me? Say praise the Lord. So I thank God. Amen. Look at you and say, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be like Moses. I didn't, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop serving God. What was it in him mm, that he could overcome mm, misinterpretations of his people and rejection of his people and the wrath of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt? What was it in this man that gave him an insistence and a persistence and an endurance to do God's will? It says in the last part, and I'm going to let you go. For he endured, say he endured, endured. as seeing him who is invisible. He couldn't see him with his natural eye. You don't see him with your natural eye. But in your spirit, you draw near to him. You focus, when you focus on God, when you see him in your spirit... You will endure. It gives you the ability to be persistent and insistent and to continue and not quit. Because you're not looking at things from the natural. You keep your eyes on the Lord. And it doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter what comes in your life. You've got something that won't quit and won't move. Because you know God is true. His word is true. And you don't fear because you believe in your God. And so as long as you and I draw near to God, as long as we have a relationship with God, as long as we focus on God, that will cause a holy boldness to rise up in you and a holy boldness to rise up in me. And that will be a faith that will endure. That will be a faith that will forsake. When he forsook, he forsook the treasures. He forsook the pleasures. He forsook Even the throne. Because he saw him that was invisible. And he said, I would rather serve him. And the reward that he gives is greater than anything the world can offer me. And that's why he was persistent and insistent. Hallelujah. He knew what the outcome was going to be. Because God had already told him. Praise God. And because he knew that although the wrath of man might rise up against the church. He knew the wrath of God was greater than the wrath of men. And so because he knew that he endured it as seeing him that was invisible. He saw him in the spirit. He heard the word of God. When the word of God was given to him, that word of God that came to him created pictures in his mind. 
So when he heard God's voice, he saw by the word of God these pictures. He saw Israel leaving Egypt. He saw Israel go in into the promised land. He saw them worshiping at the tabernacle. He saw them protected and provided for by God. He saw all of that because when God gave him the word, it became a word picture in his mind. How do you see a word? The only way you can see a word is when the word comes, comes to you and it becomes a picture in your mind. Say praise God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You have to have a revelation of Jesus in your life. If you have a revelation of Jesus in your life, you will not perish. Because you will endure as seeing him that is invisible. That means you're going to live for eternity. You know judgment's coming. You know the day of judgment's coming. And you know the reward for the righteous is coming. And therefore, you are insistent and persistent and persistent that God's will be done in your life. It is because you have seen him. You have a revelation of him that you're able to go on. Would you stand? Father, we come before you right now. We thank you for your blessings in our life today. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Stir us up, O oh God, by your word. Speak to this church this morning, God. Help us, Lord, to get rid of complacency, apathy. God, let us find a place of prayer where we can dedicate, recommit ourselves to you. Recommit our dedication, our service, our life, our worship unto you, God. Renew us, oh God. Give us a fresh anointing. If you lift your hands, God's going to touch you right now. If you lift your hands, God's presence is going to move on you. If you lift your hands and worship Him and rededicate and consecrate your life to Him, you're going to feel the fire of God come on your life. I feel His fire in my hands right now. I feel the presence of God in this church right now. Let us have a zeal for our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. 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 You still got oil in your vessels. Is the lamp burning bright? Is your worship on fire? Do you have fire at the altar of sacrifice? Is it still burning hot? Do you have a fire in the holy place of prayer and, and praise? The menorah. Do you have a fire in the most holy place? place the altar of incense king of kings and lord of lords let us relight the fire today God in your name let us be persistent and insistent by faith not fearing the wrath of the king but as seeing him who is invisible, enduring as seeing him who is invisible in the name of Jesus. God cares about you. God is concerned about you. When God brings his word to us and admonishes us, when his word goes forth, it's because he cares. He sees when we drift. He sees when we're not what we should be. He sees when we're in a backslidden state. And he comes once again in his love and his mercy and his grace. 
for everything that he did in Egypt was out of his love for people. Every sign, every judgment that fell was the goodness of God. That they would turn, that the Egyptians would turn, that the people of God would turn and call him Lord. Call him God and walk with him and trust him and believe. Lord, we thank you today that you're our God, Jesus, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt is the God of the New Testament. His name is Jesus. We will not quit by your grace. We will continue by your grace. We will go forward by your grace. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. How many of y'all serve the one God of the Bible? The one God of the Bible. His name is Jesus.